take that lightly. Um, I'm not used to having people clap for me when I come up to a stage. It seems a little off. So if we could never do that again, that'd be wonderful. Um, <laughs> uh, but I do come from a m- metropolis of Harrison City. Uh, I'm sure many of you have never heard of that. Uh, it's one road crossing another near a gas station, but the Lord's faithful there as well. Um, I get to be uh, the first speaker to kick this off. Uh, I want to go to the Lord together uh, before we start here in prayer for God's grace and blessing in that endeavor as I'll try my best uh, to do something as weighty as this, uh, to begin to speak God's word to this issue. Um, And I ask for uh, you to pray with me for his grace. So let's do that. Father God, Lord, uh, Lord, we thank you that you brought us here this evening. Lord, we pray. So we just sang, Lord. We pray, we have your word, we have your spirit. Lord, we need nothing else. Father, this conference does not have to be 3,000 people. This conference has to be those who are burdened by your word and your spirit. Lord, we understand that it took Gideon over only 300 men and you wanted no more. But Father, we ask that you would. Please hear us. We repent. We confess our sins to you now. Lord, we ask that you would rid this blood guiltiness from our land. Let this conference even be part of your great plan. Be merciful to us, Lord, and give us what we do not deserve. Give us your mercy and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I promise now that I've been invited um, into the inner sanctum of a Baptist church, well, not really, they only put me in the gym, as you can see, um, that I will only quote the Westminster Confession once. Uh, So you have to wait for that later. Uh, Please turn with your Bibles, uh, or on your phones, or we might have it on the screen, maybe not. Uh, 1 John uh, 4-7. We'll be looking here as my topic, my burden uh, my task that was given to me was to define or to lay out the groundwork. The, I'm, if we were to think of this conference as a building, I am the mason. I'm laying the foundation stones here. Uh, it might not be high uh, fly uh, standing as when um, Rusty Thomas or other speakers address some key issues, but I hope that I would be faithful to lay a good foundation to say why we can say we know who defines love and who defines justice. For that purpose, we'll turn to 1 John 4, 7. God's word is this. He says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Because God is love. In this is love. The love of God was made manifest among us. That God sent His own Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us. Sent His own Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Here in this verse we see the outlining, the foundation laid for how we could ever dare to say we know what love is. For we know as Christians we are to love one another. We are to love one another. It's it's plain enough. Love is defined. Uh, If we don't love, that is John saying we're actually not born of God. This is showing us that we are not from the Zion of heaven. We have not been born of the Spirit from above. If you cannot love in any way defined by God's parameters, it means you do not know God because God is love. And if you knew Him, you would. There is no theoretical knowledge in Scripture. To know something is to be changed. To know God is therefore to begin to love like God. And if you do not love like God, you do not know God, he says. These connections are beautiful. We are here because of love. From the outset 
I will define the conference so far in the vanguard position to say this conference exists because of love. But the name of this conference is not love. It's love and justice. Why? Who has the wisdom to really define these terms? This is love, John says. He defines it for us. This is love. Not that we have loved God, he says, but that he has loved us. And that's a beautiful clue. He flips it on every humanitarian's head to say, you, I, we do not get to define our love bottom up to God. Not that we have loved him, he has loved us. He has imposed his definition of love from a top down upon us. And not just in a word, but the word. He has brought his own son from the top down upon us to love us that way. He has made the most definitive love into the very body and incarnation of his own eternally begotten son. That's a definition of love I think we could build upon. And from the beginning, we are disabused of any false pretension or assumption that we would ever presume to define love from the bottom up. Not that we have loved God, but that He has loved us. But then again, this conference isn't called love. It's called love and justice. What does He say next? How has God loved us? He has sent His own Son to be a propitiation for our sins. And there it is. Love and justice. Propitiation in the Greek, elisterion, means the appeasement of wrath. The appeasement of anger, indignation. That he was the appeasement of this for us. And what is this wrath? It is nothing more than a manifestation of God's justice. His just wrath. Matched with his incarnate son giving his body to cover us from that wrath in love. So therefore at the center we have in a perfect unity an image of both God's eternal nature being manifested in time and space through the Son, that he would be perfectly love and perfectly justice. We know from Deuteronomy 32.4, we are told that this rock, our God is a rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness without iniquity, just and upright is he. He is justice. And the verse we read here is where he says, anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. He is love. He is justice. In his perfect simplicity, he is those things. In perfect unity, his essence and existence are one. There's not a time when God is not loving, and there's not a time when God is not just. But there's a time in time and space when the Son was manifested in love and absorbed all this justice. And now we have to deal with our lives where he comes to us and says, now you, put that in perspective, What I just barely even scratched the surface on as far as defining God's love and his own self-sacrificial giving of his son, that would be wonderful to worship in that alone. And then, again, he pauses us there and says, now love, love like that. So we could say very well, When it comes to this issue of abortion, emotions are high. They're very high. It's very hostile. It's very political. Everybody is slandered, misinterpreted, put inside a political uh, pigeonhole or painted into a corner to be silenced, to be um, quieted, to be uh, discredited. As Christians from the beginning, we say, as we take this issue of abortion seriously, we refuse to be slandered or defiled, refuse to be characterized in the sense that we would position ourselves in a place of self-righteousness, that we would position ourselves in a place in which we had assumed the moral high ground, that we know what's wrong with society, and we know you shouldn't kill babies. Congratulations, Christians, you shouldn't kill babies. There's no self-righteousness here. 
We know love in this way. Not that we have loved God, but he has loved us and sent his own son to be a propitiation for our sins. Not Planned Parenthood sins. Ours. And from the very beginning, we have not one ounce of self-righteousness in this. We are no different apart from his grace. We are murderers in heart. And some of our sins, even in this room, dare I say, some of our sins in this room were crimes. And so they might grab us on the news outlets. They might twist, again, the American evangelical taken to the water, taken to the back shed in the public media. And they never play clips like this if it ever would go viral. But we are sinners deserving God's just wrath. We have no self-righteousness in this at all. But because of the love in which he has loved us, we must love. And so therefore, very well then we say, all right, we must love. Let us love. Helping old ladies across the street perhaps. Cutting our neighbor's grass when he's on vacation. Or maybe we could donate a few clothes to a homeless shelter. What do you do with 63 million slaughtered humans? Suddenly the sentimentality of moral do-goodism for Mr. Rogers does not seem sufficient to handle such a problem. How would we deal with that? And I don't mean sentimentality in the sense that we eat American uh, apple pie on the 4th of July. What I seek to do here for the time that we have is to go down again, I was saying, the foundation, the base root of where we can find grounds for even coming to a definition of love and justice. I mean sentimentality in this, moral sentimentalism, that is, moral obligations or the need to love and exercise justice are grounded in our emotions, our emotional response. Our moral evaluations arise from emotions. Emotions are served as the primary grounds for knowing what is right and wrong. That won't cut it. But that is all that really exists in our culture. The fact that someone has a strong feeling that maybe babies shouldn't be murdered. But see, as we have in our culture, one person might say there is a right, there's a justice to life. And they're emotionally passionate, involved in all this. Why? They saw a picture of a 10-week child mutilated in blood. And their response, emotionally, visceral, almost as the evisceration of that body was presented before them, moved them. And they had a strong moral indignation against abortion. Great. Another person sees the same picture with a right to choose, emotionally passionate about all these things and social justice and the woman's right. They see that same image of a 10-week child. It produces the same emotional but equally opposite emotional response in which they are self-righteously angry that someone would put such a violent picture in front of them. That some religious, uh, uh, Christian, evangelical would be out there with a a street sign putting these images in front of the the good society of Pittsburgh, have you? It it produces the same emotional reaction. This is where the debate is. This is where the fight is. It's equally emotion on both sides. And this is where the church needs to come up from the slumber. Because the irony of all this is that if we are left to moral relativism, that is, that Only what counts for what is morally right or wrong is the consensus of everyone's sentiment toward a particular moral act. So if you feel like this is really wrong, and enough people feel like this is really wrong, then finally we'll say it's probably wrong. Well, do you see what that has done to the church? Some people, the irony is that you would be all geared toward your emotional response toward moral decisions, and because of that, you would have actual apathy. That's how I was saying when we started off. That is the problem. The Francis Schaeffer quote. The church does not care. Apathy. Why? Because of emotion. If you rely on emotion, it exhausts itself to apathy. Someone's really passionate about life. Someone's really passionate about the euphemistic phrase to choose. 
that passion dwindles down to, well, you have your view and I have my view. More relativism. That passion dwindles down to a bunch of Christians in the pews. Well, abortion's always going to be with us. You know, people, we're a democracy, and if enough people aren't for it, then what can we do? What can we do? If people have emotional decisions to wanting to kill their baby, then it must be, I guess, permissible. No one would, no one would think through it that way. But that is the apathy. They've been lulled to sleep by this. And the church is not awakened to the moral problem in front of us. Apart from the eternal triune God, autonomous man in his own philosophy knows that there is no way out of this problem. Emotion cannot be a guide. So what I will say is this, is let's just imagine if we were to say we did not have the word of God Many would fall on natural theology or uh, natural religion and think of natural um, ethics and logic on human reasoning, and that can make you so far. But actually, throughout the history of philosophy, again, this is a philosophical message because I am laying down the subroot of how we can possibly come to know what is love, what is justice. We have autonomous man in all his philosophy knows that there is no grounds for these things. They have, over the past so many hundreds of years, sought this out with every intellectual ability of the most gifted intellectual people in Western culture for the past so many years. Particularly thinking of David Hume, an atheistic empiricist, an analytic philosopher, G.E. Moore, one pre-modern, one modern man. They both came to the same logical conclusion that there is this thing called a naturalistic fallacy. That is, that it is logically not tenable. It is not valid. It is not sound to say that something is. And because it is, therefore, you ought to be morally, morally obliged to do something about it. That never followed throughout all their thinking. This great separation of the things that exist and your moral obligation to change them cannot come upon you by your own mind. Because, as we said before, with sentimentality, somebody has this opinion, and somebody has that opinion, and who's to say, because we're all four feet tall, morally. We're all the same. We're just humans. Who's the tall man? Who's the wise man? Who's the smart man? Who's the man that Job met at the end of his book and said, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who's going to stand to that? Who has that on their resume? None of us. Therefore, we all apathetically say, well, who am I to say what's right? G.E. Moore, David Hume, with their Bibles closed and their arrogant, autonomous mind, hard at work, came to the exact same conclusion. That there is no ultimate grounds for this. Because something is, it does not imply that it should ought. Simple examples. People would think, whenever you listen to evolutionists or whatnot, they always reason by way of analogy into whatever way they want to. It just really just shows them it's showing you who they really want or what they want to go to. They're not actually thinking logically. For example, monkeys. Naturally, there's a natural occurrence in this world that monkeys pick bugs off each other's back. There go. Therefore, it is natural that we should eat each other's bugs out of our hair. Natural reasoning. And this is the thing. It's funny. But logically, who's to say otherwise? Logically. In the garden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, who knows? Has God not said? Did he really say? This is it. And think how it can work. Well, one you might like, maybe I'll like it. Some bears get to sleep for eight months out of the year. Naturally, of course, just naturally. Therefore, I'm taking a vacation. But also, naturally, some grizzlies eat their young. Naturally. But they don't do nearly as well a job as us. Naturally. 63 million. I doubt that happens in nature. But you could reason for it if you wanted to. 
if you wanted to, naturally. This great separation of really having no way to even say what exists and therefore you and I should do anything and I should get off this pulpit now. This great separation that exists is holy. It's, it has a certain separation of sanctity. We know naturally, right, that we actually don't have the right to impose morality upon anybody. We feel the hypocrisy in doing that. Who is wise enough for these things? To separate or divide. The definition, the task upon me is to find love and justice. Who has the right to define them? For defining them is like cutting them. Definitions are like knives. If you make, lay out a definition for anything, by, by what you're doing analytically, you're actually precluding categories from other categories. Dogs and horses, fish and rocks. You define them and what you're doing intellectually is you're dividing the world. Now, a good definition is if you can match it with the reality. A bad definition means it doesn't fit reality. And so here we have this idea of a knife. Definitions are like knives. They cut things apart, but also like knives, they're not to be played with by children. Children who play with knives hurt. I was with my daughter earlier in the week. She asked to help me make dinner. And there was a bag of ingredients she had in her hand. And I gave her the knife, and uh, she's only four. Uh, and if that's just what dads do, you'll figure that out. And um, she, she just wanted to cut right up the side of the bag. And she had her hand right there holding the bag. And from uh, my perspective, it was obvious that the line of the scissors and the position of her fingers were going to have a problem. And so, coming alongside her, her not being able to handle that knife, say, hey, Lily, on the top of the bag, there's these dotted lines, and a little symbol for scissors. And here you go, you just cut right across, and there it is. Our definitions are like that. We only have the right to define along God's dotted lines. That is, we... We can't just take our definitions and cut whatever we want in the world as if it actually were reality. Adam was given the ability to name the animals, not to create the animals. That's important. Here is a bear, here is a horse, call it whatever you want. But you describing it does not change what it is. That is where we get to love and justice. Call it a baby. Call it a fetus. If that bothers you, because fetus just means baby in Latin, call it a clump of cells. But you have not changed it at all. That's the problem. Your definition, if misdefined, is more dangerous than scissors in my daughter's hand. That is our problem. We have defined things that are not true. We are children. He is the Father. We dare not pick up a knife apart from His sovereign superintention, apart from His word. We are fools. God's word in Scripture is likened to this knife. Obviously, Hebrews 4 The Word of God is living and active, sharp with any double-edged sword, dividing joint and marrow, soul and spirit, cutting right to your inner man. But not only that, here we have this beautiful intro as God explains himself in Genesis, that he has done what every pagan philosopher has never been able to do by natural logical reasoning. From the beginning, he unites reality and morality. Everything that is and everything that ought to be the first day. He separates like a knife with his word. His word's just so sharp and active. Active in the sense that when he says things, they come into being ex nihilo, out of nothing. That's a pretty active word. He speaks and separates. 
cuts it right down the middle and defines it. This is light and this is darkness. So what he did is he created reality with his words and then immediately dovetailing after that is morality. And he saw it and it was good. No one else gets to say that. Do you want your trees to go sideways? It doesn't matter because God made them to grow vertically and he likes it that way. He saw it and it was good. He took what reality, the word that creates the stars, also gives valuation, moral underpinnings, moral definitions to the same things he creates. They had to be that way because it pleased him. And that's enough. And the second day, he separates again the waters above from the waters below. And he calls them heavens. And it's a great expanse of definition. The third day, he separates the land from the sea. And he causes all the water to accumulate in one place and dry land emerges. And he divides it and he says, this is land and this is sea. And we're told that it was, he saw it and it was good. Didn't even say it, he saw it. The perceptions of God upon this world is what matter. The perceptions, have you seen a developing fetus with your own two eyes? It doesn't matter. Because God does. And it is good. That's why any other ground except that is irrelevant. Did you see the creation of the world? David says, I was formed in the depths of the earth. Have you seen the depths of the earth emerge from the bottoms of the sea? No, but God did. And he liked it a lot. And that's why. Aside from these definitions, where is the drive of the church? Where is the church's lungs to be breathed in by the Holy Spirit and have a conviction to see this evil done? There's nothing. You have to be convinced upon the word. You cannot be motivated by sentiment. Not a democratic poll of maybe 80% of evangelical Christians think this is a problem. Now let's address it. That is not how it works. That will not get people out of the pews. That will not get people to end this murder. They have to be convinced that God hates it because he sees it even when you don't see it. He sees what happens on 7th Avenue in Pittsburgh. And you've never seen it, but it doesn't make it not wicked. His perception, his omniscience, the grounding of love and justice in the image of God. And here it is. This is why we are here. Not just because God separated the waters from the waters and because he separated dry land from sea. We're here because of this verse. Dignity, honor, glory bestowed upon humanity. In Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. That's what we read in 1 John 4. Top, down. Why is our unborn neighbor valuable? Top, down. Because from the top, from God's sovereign position as the eternal triune God who speaks stardust into existence, he has also said, that child bears my image. And he has never said that about the stars. He's never said it about the mountains, the rocks, the moles, or the moose. There is one in all of creation that is given this appellation. This being bears the dignity and glory and honor of being like me. There is nothing in creation that is like God. There is nothing that is God. We're not pantheists. But we also know that nothing else could even be equated in an analogous, not equivocal, but analogous language to be able to say, you are like God unformed clump of cells. You are like God. The potentiality locked up inside of you is glorious and you are like him for one reason. You are to be similar enough to him so that you can worship him. 
You can commune with him. You can have union and communion with him. You were created for that. Malachi 3, it says, why did the spirit given to them in their union and marriage? Why? So that they would have godly offspring, godly children. They were made in that image so that they might live in perfect communion with God. Without that conviction, what does it really matter if someone has a few more shivers in their liver against abortion? If it's just emotion, and some people are emotively prone to not like abortion, and some people are emotively prone to like abortion, what does it matter? It only matters because they have been from top down bestowed with the dignity and honor of being given the title, image of God. And now this if you thought that argument might have been somewhat convincing, let's take two more steps. Genesis 9, even in our sinfulness, that was spoken to a sinless Adam. The children that come from the womb are not sinless. They're still valuable. That's what's amazing. Whoever sheds the blood of man, Genesis 9, 6, by a man shall his blood be shed. Justice for killing. Why? For God made them in his image. Fallen image. Marred, but not gone. You can squint and turn your head sideways and see the glory of God in anyone. It's not glowing from their face like maybe Moses. But you can find it. It's still there. They bear his image, even as wicked sinners. Anyone who even touches a wicked sinner's life is met with such love that is violently protected in justice that he who sheds blood shall by man's blood be shed because he's made in his image. One more step. If that will not put a passion, a burden upon the church to see this is important. Colossians 1.15 There is a renewed image. He, Jesus, our Lord, that in this great age of redemption that you and I live now, Jesus is our Lord. And he, in Colossians 1.15, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from all creation. That is to say, the crime is worse than it ever was before after the resurrection of Jesus Christ because Jesus is the perfect image of God and we, united with him as fellow image bearers of God, are being renewed into that perfect image. Therefore, the child in the womb who will never see the light of day was given even greater privilege to not just be a marred, partially glorious image of God walking across the earth that was taken from them, but they could have been a renewed, redeemed, glorious image of God made after the likeness of Jesus Christ that was taken from them. The image is even more valuable than it was before because it has been inaugurated in the beginning of the restoration of that image by God loving us through his own son, again, top down. We know love this way, not that we have loved God, but he has loved us by sending his own son to be a propitiation for our sins. And in that, renewing our very dignity, honor, and glory, and value by making a humanity that truly is in the image of God. And that's what's being robbed from these children, as if that were not enough. This, understood, motivates the church. Any other grounds for what might be called justice as we close here, will be faulty, failing. Capacity's approach to justice. When they have a heartbeat, then there's a right to life. When they have brain waves, then there's a right to life. When they have lung function, then they have a right to life. When they're finally off their parents' medical insurance, then they have a right to life. Where does it stop, you see, the capacities? It's an infinite regress of whatever you might want, whichever way your heart flutters, whichever way you're emotively turned to say, now this is a right to life. You have no objective, definitive definition of what is a right to life. Let it be a right to life or in a negative justice, a right not to be murdered or a primary right that this is a life that is due you by virtue of your image bearing of God. Whichever way you want to define justice, you cannot define it on a sliding scale of capacity's approach to justice or dignity approach to justice, a complexity and a beauty. Riverstones are valuable. Diamonds are more valuable. They're crystallized and beautiful and worth more. 
CD players still play music. Your smartphone's more valuable. But how about this? A clump of cells. It's not valuable. A clump of cells? Well, what, what if it's a paraplegic? What if they're mentally incapacitated? What if their complexity, what if their utility and dignity is limited? Then we can justify murder for anybody and everything. I mean, I'm balding. I'm, I'm free game. In Leviticus, I couldn't even be, enter into the holies with this. So we know we have problems. Isn't that wild? Where do you draw the line? It doesn't matter. It only matters where your liver shivers. How do you feel about it? That will not move the church. Without these definitions, it doesn't matter. I'll end with a story. I came across this story uh, uh, with, uh, by a man named Robert um, Wolf. And he had it for an entirely different purpose. I'm literally, and I do this regularly in sermons, I just take people's stuff completely out of context and make it work for me. And I hope this works for you. Um, it's the story of the analytic butcher. Maybe you heard this, probably not. It's a story of a contest that was conducted. There was a great prize, and it caused two people to join in. The person who wanted the prize the most was a man who was an analytic philosopher. He had all his thinking and theology worked out on his own natural reason, of course. And the other one was a butcher. They were both taken in by the prize, and the philosopher went first. Now, on the table set before them was a large side of beef. And the contest was, in the shortest amount of time, cut up that beef in the best way possible. And so the beef was presented before him. He rolled up his perfectly white shirt that never saw an ounce of work its whole days. Didn't know how the real world worked at all. And then he took out this large leather bag. And inside that was a gleaming, shining example of all the perfect scalpels and little knives and perfect uniformity cleaned as though they've never done anything or been part of the real world at all. And he took that scalpel out and he began to work and carve this beef. He did. And it revealed to him that he would inspect the surface of the beef and figure out ways to cut. But really as he did, as an analytic philosopher always does, is cut it up into every vertical and horizontal piece as small as he could do it to get as many pieces on the table as he could. And he had at the end all of these tiny little cubes of beef on his table. And after one hour later, he rolled down his sleeves after washing his hands, quite content with himself, thinking, I have done it. The butcher came. He put on his apron and his overalls, got out his meat cleaver and his knife, cut the gristle and the fat, cut along all the joints and against the grain. He cut quickly but not too quickly, confidently and knowing where every joint would be. He did it smoothly, underlying all the edges. It seemed as though he saw this beef with dotted lines outlined upon it in his imagination. And the judge came and the contest was over. He looked at both of their tables and almost immediately awarded to the butcher. This is the important part. And so therefore, that analytic philosopher was angry, furious. His pride was hurt. And he said, why would you not award me? Look at all the pieces I have produced. Tiny little pieces, all equally measured in cubes, all uniform in size. The judge responds, of course, it was an easy decision. The butcher set the table array with porterhouse and T-bone and sirloin and beef roast and all the pieces left to be ground for meat. The butcher knew where the joints were. He cut against the grain in exactly the right places. You reduced this perfectly fine piece of beef to stew. There is nothing left here except for soup. The danger of cutting when you don't understand the nature of reality. Friends, I'm telling you this because I will add to that story to say 
that the butcher was so insulted. He has bitten of that tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he knew he could discern what was right and what was wrong. And he took off his garments there and donned the white lab coat and said, I'll never be a butcher again. I won't be a metaphysician. I'll be a medical physician. That is what we have. Cutting, slicing, dicing, and not knowing with no knowledge of the metaphysical, metaphysical universe that there are image bearers of God distinct from the placenta. Oh my goodness, come on. Cut the umbilical cord and go no further. How could you be so foolish? Philosophers, men with natural reason that slice and dice and murder. And David says, I was formed in the depths of the earth, not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, your eyes, they saw what was there. They saw my unformed substance. And in your book were written for me all the days of my life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your grace. Lord, we thank you to be able to say that your propitiation was for our sins. Lord, we ask for your grace to convince our nation, bring revival and reformation to our nation, enlighten them by your word and your spirit to see the evil, repent and turn from their ways, and they will be saved. Either way, this would happen, Lord. We ask you would save the children and keep us from your wrath and your blood guiltiness, Lord. Let this prayer be one more piece of you staying your hand. Be merciful. In Jesus' name, in she, for, for Christ's sake, be merciful. Amen.